We're now starting a new year, and we're hoping that this opening lesson will be a type of a map or a guideline for this upcoming year, for at least the beginning part of this year, at least to give us some direction until Hanukkah, at least God willing, to get ready for the lights of Hanukkah through this mindset presented to us by Rabbi Nachman in his Likute Moran. Just a brief overview of this amazing lesson, lesson 35 of Likute Moran. This lesson is going to demonstrate and show to us how everything's in the head. In other words, your mind and your mindset and your mind frame, everything connected to your mind is what really can help you get through everything in life. Everything is already in your head. What's needed is to bring it out. In this lesson, Rabbi Nachman will focus on how by a person guarding his mind, guarding his thoughts, making sure nothing foreign enters his mind. This is the key to giving the mind its proper strength, its proper force. And, but that's not enough. A, a person also, he says, needs to renew his mind, both guarding, protecting the mind from foreign objects, and number two, refreshing, renewing the mind, allows the person to expand their mind. And when the mind is expanded, a person can accomplish almost anything. It's known already, and even in Judaism, this is discussed, that we don't really use that much of our brain. We're using a very small percentage of our mind. That's very true. Because seeing the power of the mind, the power of the human being to learn and to absorb education, to learn and everything, and then to discover that there's endless levels of wisdom. And plus, when we discover there's what's called true wisdom and fake wisdom, we begin to discover that there's the wisdom of the Torah. And then when a person enters the wisdom of the Torah, he begins to see that it's literally endless. It's endless, endless levels of perception and understanding. And the mind can be a receiver to absorb all of this. And there's much more beyond that. It comes to show you the amazing ability that Hashem has ingrained in the human mind of what it can absorb, plus its power, what it can accomplish. Rabbi Nachman teaches when you guard your mind, from not letting foreign items in it, items which should not be in there, you have now the power to overcome all types of bad traits and negative lusts and desires and addictions. They are, they are all a result of letting in the wrong things into your head. And if now you guard your mind properly, you can really, really get rid of all types of negative traits. What he's saying basically, is by dealing with the root of its problem at the at the pro the root of the problem at its source, that's how it can be taken care of. Just give a nice little example. Today I had to take one of my daughters to a an acne skin doctor, and he gave her a prescription for acne. And when my daughter left the room, I told the doctor, "You do believe that you know teenagers having acne and everything." That's due to something deeper like peer pressure and lack of self-confidence. And by just giving them like an acne, an anti-acne uh, medication, it's like just putting a, a patch on the wound. It's not dealing with the problem. He says he agrees 100%. Just that the, the, the child, the, the patient, needs something to work on in the meantime. That's what the acne medication is to take care of all these pimples and everything. But the real source of where it's coming from is that a person has something deeper in their mind which is causing a trigger for that. We can go beyond, really, and say that everything is dependent on the mind and on the body. And everything within the human body is already there to deal with the problems. I'm not just inventing this. Believe it or not, this is taken from the Talmud. The Talmud, in tractate Masechet Chulin, brings a very interesting story of there was a Jewish man who had a major accident and fell from a very like high wall, crashed, and when falling, the stomach of the person 
cracked open and the intestines came out. And as is known, a person can't live like that. A person can't survive. Watching all this happen was a Roman, uh, a Roman, if you want to say doctor, who was very expert in all types of herbs and natural uh, medicines. And look what he did. The Gemara explains what this Roman uh, doctor did. He quickly asked the people to bring the son of this Jewish man to him ASAP. The Jewish man was dying. He was slowly dying with his stomach outside, right from the fall. So the Roman brought the son of the man, the, the man who was wounded, in front of him. And he pretended as if he slaughtered, he, as if he slit the throat of the son. He did like a pretending, like he, he made, brought fake blood quickly or something. He did some type of a, of, a, of a performance as if he cut, he slaughtered, he killed the son. When the father saw his son being killed in front of him, it was again pretending, it wasn't real. So the fear, the pain, caused the internal organs of the body to litkavets, to shrink, to, to go inwards. And by doing so, the body pulled back in the intestines because now, because of the fear of seeing, the pain of seeing his son being killed in front of his eyes, so he was even more pained of that, more than he, that he's dying, that he's, he's in pain by his stomach coming out. But what actually happened is that the, the body pulled back in, the muscles pulled back in the intestines in a way that no human being can do that. And when the Roman doctor saw that the intestines were practically all the way in, he quickly sewed up the stomach, the outside of the stomach, and then showed the man that his son was still alive. And the Gemara brings this amazing story to show that the best healer of the body is the body itself. This is needed very, very, very much today because we are faced with major maladies and sicknesses and the major attitude of people is that we're very futile and weak and we have no other choice but to rely on the opinion of the doctors and medicines and the medical world. To a degree, the medical world can help assist, but they cannot heal. Ultimately, it's the body which is healing. Rabbi Nachman teaches in this lesson, quoting the Gemara, the Gemara states clearly in Brachot that the neshama, the soul of a human being, is what nurtures the body. The nurturing and life and sustenance of the body comes to the neshama, which obviously is receiving that power from Hashem. But the point is, everything you need to help yourself is already within you. What is needed is to bring it out. Rabbi Nachman's main teaching to do this, to come to this level, is obviously a lot of davening. A lot of davening that a person should reach a level where he connects so much to his soul because it's like we have in a sense two entities inside us we have our subconscious state and our conscious state the conscious level that we interact with people and talk and eat and live and work is not always connected to the subconscious level which is the real me the real ani the real me is my neshama i'm not so in tune to it what can I do to connect myself to my neshama? Rabbi Nachman teaches is a lot of davening, that's for sure. And the breakthrough to connect to the neshama is purifying the mind. Because the mind is the seat of the neshama. Just to explain these introductory ideas, in Judaism we stress very much that every Jew has what's called five, so you can see my fingers, five souls. We have the lower soul called the nefesh, the spirit called the ruach, and their upper soul called the neshama. And we have two other high levels which are virtually almost unattainable by the average person. The fourth level is called the chaya, the living essence. And the fifth highest level is called the yechida, the singular oneness. Every Jew has interaction in their life with nefesh, ruach, neshama. The lower soul, which is what we use for interaction, our movement and everything, and our talking and everything, Everything is from the nefesh, like it says in the parsha Bereshit, Vahi ha'ish, the, the nefesh chaya, and also in creating the creatures, the animals, nefesh chaya, a living soul, a living soul, and onkulus translates by the human creation, nefesh chaya, a living soul, he translates it as ruach 
a speaking spirit. That the nefesh is what's giving us our movement. The nefesh is present in the blood mainly, in the whole blood of the body. Then you have the ruach, the spirit, which is connected to the oxygen, the air, which goes into the heart, the lungs, the, the heart. The ruach is also the spirit, the spirit of a person, which generates the energy to the nef nefesh, the lower soul, is a bit higher. That's the in the that's in the the heart. That's the located mainly in the heart, because the heart is what takes the oxygen from the lungs and brings it into the blood. The blood is using the 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 ruach, the oxygen. So the nefesh and the blood is using the ruach to function. We just have more basic face-to-face -face interaction with our nefesh. The ruach is behind the scenes, but behind that is the neshama. The place of the neshama is in the brain, the mind. So the mind, Rabbi Nachman teaches in this lesson we're going to see, is connected to the neshama. Our main way to tap into our neshama is by cleansing and purifying our brain, our mind, which requires that a person works very hard on guarding what he lets into his mind. And like we said earlier, lo zo afzo, not only this, but more is needed that a person also has to constantly renew their mind because if you don't renew it you can crash get old and rusty and that will allow foreign thoughts to find an opening to come back in and to bring a person down again and these three are what are, are daily used in our life in other words we can have access to all three levels our goal is to become in tune with the neshama the tzaddikim they're called tzaddikim because they're called alive and life, chaya, chayim, is associated with the with the with the chokma, the something which is above. There's no physical counterpart. We said the neshama is the brain, the ruach is the heart, and the nefesh is the blood. But the chaya, which is like the verse says, a chokma techayed be'alea, knowledge is what gives life. It's the knowledge feeding the neshama. The neshama is what's called Bina, understanding, that's in the brain, which afterwards brings it down to the heart. But Bina receives from something hidden, which is Chokhmah, knowledge. Bina, understanding, takes knowledge and derives from it. We don't have any direct contact to the Chokhmah, we only receive from the byproduct of Bina. Just like everything in this world is concealed, and from the conceal concealment, we understand what's really out there, that's how this world works, with Emuna. In other words, Faith, emuna, coupled with knowledge, with wisdom, this helps us to connect to chokhmah, the higher level, chokhmah, knowledge. Okay, we have understanding and wisdom, which through emuna we're able to use to eventually connect to chokhmah. We have no direct connection to the actual entity of knowledge. Those who do connect to them are these very rare tzaddikim who are called alive. Like the Gemara says that the tzaddikim, even in their passing, they're called alive. They continue to live on. Tzaddikim bemitatam keruim chayim. The tzaddikim in their passing, they're called alive. And life is associated with chokhmah, like the verse says in Kohelet, Ecclesiastes. King Solomon says there, ha-chokhmah techaye et be'aleha. The knowledge brings life to those who possess it. And that's connected to the chaya. That is a level beyond the average person. This is the level of the tzaddikim. And then the highest level, the yechida, is attained by those outstanding, outstanding, outstanding tzaddikim who are at the level of Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, and they tap into this high level called the yechida, where they reach a total, total unity with Hashem. Like we see the Torah depicts Moshe Rabbeinu reaching the highest possible levels, especially at his passing. He was buried in the mountain called Har Nevo. And like we mentioned this many times from the name of the Arizal, Nevo is Nun Bo. That in, in being buried, being passing away and being buried, buried in Mount Nevo, Nun Bo, he, he received, he internalized all 50th levels. The 50th gate, the 50th level is associated with the Yechida, the oneness, the fifth level of the Neshama. Fine. Our goal is to connect to our neshama. We need the assistance of the tzaddikim, who have earned the title of being chayim alive, to infuse our neshama, our understanding, with the wisdom, that the knowledge that they contain. 
the wisdom, the knowledge of the Torah, to bring it down, to filter it down to our neshama. But in order to do so, we have to do our best, our part, in connecting to our neshama. This is the goal of every Jew, that we try our best to, to reconnect with the neshama. This is hinted to, by the way, in every morning when we wake up, we say a few blessings, right? When we wake up in the morning, the first thing we say is, Modeani, we give to Hashem. That you you returned, restored into me my neshama. We say, we say specifically my neshama. Okay, and then we relieve ourselves. We say the blessing on the Tilat Yadayim. And then we say the blessing after relieving ourselves, Asher Yatzar. And then we say right after that a second blessing, which is said in the morning. Elokai neshama shenatata bi terora. My Lord, the neshama that you placed within me is pure right so our whole offset at the beginning of the day is relating to the neshama our goal in our day is not just to be associated with the nefesh because everybody has a nefesh even an animal has a nefesh it's not enough the movement and everything is from the nefesh we want more than that we want through the nefesh to connect to the ruach and to connect ultimately to the neshama and when we're in tune with the neshama, then we're able to receive from the tzaddikim who give us their light of the chaya, the chokhmah contained in their life, that they perceive a high level of knowledge of the Torah, and by us learning it, absorbing it into our neshama, our neshama receives power and ability to self-heal and to self-deal with problems, meaning we won't be necessarily in need of external means to help us in situations. The neshama will be the one giving us that energy. But again, in order to do that, we have to connect to the neshama. We need to really, really cleanse and purify the neshama. This is a basic, if you want to say, blueprint of the ideas behind this lesson. And with this, we will now begin lesson 35. We will be, again, using the abridged Lakute Moran. If you have received the link to this class, there's an av available a free PDF download of the entire lesson from the abridged Lakute Moran, Lesson 35, Volume 1, with the English translation. So you can, if you'd like, download it there from the link to this class. You can see it on our website, Rest of Campus, or if you got the email with the link, you can see it there. The PDF is available there of the abridged Lekutei Moran Lesson 35. So with that, we are now going to start, God willing, this amazing lesson, 35, part 1 of Lekutei Moran. This lesson has, in the bridge Lekutei Moran, 15 paragraphs. Rav Nosen had a lot to expound on this lesson, to explain on a practical level. Their ideas are phenomenal. And Bezat Hashem, let's see how far we can go, God willing, in this amazing lesson. God willing. He starts like this, Rav Nosen rephrasing Rabbi Nachman in the actual Likutei Moran Lesson 35. Paragraph number one. Da, a person should know. Ki tshuva, what is repentance? Teshuva. The word repentance, to return. What are you returning? And to where are you returning it? It's two questions. The word tshuva. I'm coming back. Okay, you're coming back to who? Uh, the obvious explanation is a Jew repents and comes back to Hashem. A person was living a life full of detachment, detachment, disconnection, no affiliation with God. So he's returning to Hashem. But where exactly is he returning to? What is... God is a very big... And I, I'm scared to say concept, but Hashem is very big. God is very, very big. There's many ways to connect to God. Which specific area or item or section are we looking to connect to when we do tshuva, when we say tshuva, repentance? So he explains Rabbi Nachman using the Zohar as his proof, the Holy Zohar. He says like this, Tshuva is what? Lehashiv hadavar lamakom shenital misham. You are basically restoring, returning the item to the place that it was taken from before. So in the case of a Jew who repents, when we say he's coming back, 
that that gives us the uh, feeling and the notion that's the word the notion that the person was originally there he left religion he left God and now he's coming back that's basically how we explain it the Hashiv is returning if you're returning that means you were once here and that is the case that every Jew the soul before it enters the body was really connected to the divine to the spiritual at a very high level at a very connected level and then being born into this world and raised in the secular hidden uh, scenario surrounding that a person is born into and then grow nurtured and grown up and all the ideas that come and through this maze to wake up to realize and reconnect to Hashem and to come back this is the understood picture of tshuva so let's see how Rabbi Nachman builds this picture for a more clear refined perspective he says like this tshuva is like we explained to restore or return the item to the place that it was taken from in the first place which is Bechinat Zarka Zarka is the name of one of the musical notes the cantillations of reading the Torah as we know we every Shabbat we read from the Torah and it's customary and proper to read the Torah with special cantillations there are of course different customs in what the cantillations are for example the Hasidim have some one type of cantillation the Ashkenazim have another type of cantillation the Yemenite Jews have another cantillation the Moroccan Jews have another cantillation the regular Sephardi Jews have another cantillation but there are these tunes they're called cantillations and it's proper and it's customary to just not just to read the Torah even though technically you fulfill your obligation of hearing the Torah even just being read like that without any cantillation but it is proper that the right cantillation associated with each word is recited if you look at every standard Chumash you will see that the words of the uh, in the Chumash have both vowel points and cantillations and little types of dots and little types of like pictures and stuff that indicate how to sing not just, not just how to pronounce the pronouncing is the vowels but how to sing this word when reading the Torah publicly on Shabbat and on Monday morning and Thursday morning okay so there's one tune it's called Zarka and it's shaped like a hook like this shaped like a type of a V okay and it's like a hook in a way it's and it indicates something being thrown it looks like whoop you're throwing an item from point a going around and then bringing it to point b it has a curvature but it's like a it's like shaped in a way like you're throwing an item so zarka is connected to the hebrew word zorek zarak which means to throw you're throwing an item so the zohar comments on this cantillation Zarka, the Tikkun Ezor, really, the book called the Tikkun Ezor by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Zarka, the Zohar expounds on what Zarka is. Zarka is Lashiv Ulachzer Davar Lashorsho. Zarka, that cantillation, is associated with the activity of repentance, which could mean on a deeper level that words in the Torah that have the cantillation of Zarka over it. Right, that U-shaped cantillation, there is a deeper meaning of that word in the Torah that's connected to the concept of returning. In other words, something major in the Torah's account, if it's a story, like we're reading now many stories in the book of Genesis, Bereshit, or when it'll come to the laws coming up in the book of Shemot, and the sacrifices in Vayikra, and then also Bamidbar has more laws, and Dvarim has the summary, of all the Torah laws and the Korbanot, etc. So wherever a major in, uh, concept is discussed, that you'll find a word that has a major part in the expression of the Torah's expounding on the idea, the words that have a major, major part in the story or issue or concept or item have the Zarka on it. The formation of that cantillation Zarka. And the Zohar says, the Tikkun Zohar says, that this zarka 
is associated with the concept of repentance, returning. I'm returning the item back to its source. So that cantillation, zarka, is associated to it. And Rabbi Nachman is using this point to express what tshuva really is, that you're throwing back the item to the place where it was taken from initially. And he goes, and just, in, just instead of just explaining the idea, Rabbi Nachman goes out of his way to borrow the Zohar's term called Zarka, because he wants to express what it is, is you're throwing it back, throwing the item back. And we're going to see, as he develops its items, how are you throwing it back, and why is it so connected to this term, this cantillation called Zarka? So again, he says, which is the Zohar, Tshuva is associated with Zarka, and again, he explains, in other words, going back to what we said, to restore and return the item to its root. The root, he's explaining better Rav Nosson the idea. That's what tshuva is. Returning and restoring the item back to its root. Wow. Now what is the root? If now tshuva associates restoring an item back to its root, what is the root of all the other roots in this world? This is amazing. The root of all the roots that you're looking to reconnect to, obviously it's Hashem, God. But what is the <clears throat> configuration? What is the specific constriction I'm looking for in order to reconnect my root to Hashem? Shorsh kol advarim hu chokhmah. The root of all items in this world is chokhmah, knowledge. Moshe Katuv, the verse proving that is taken from King David's Psalms, Psalm 104, Kulam Bechokma Asita. Everything in this world, Hashem, in with wisdom, with knowledge, sorry, did you make it? Everything was made with knowledge. So he's saying, Rabbi Nachman, that since knowledge was the beginning point of developing everything in creation. Everything, the beginning point of this world that we know it, including human being, is Chokhmah. That's what the verse in, by King David indicates. Everything, he's saying about Hashem, everything with knowledge did you make, Asita. So if that's the beginning, that, that, was, that, was, that was the root, that was what, what, what was used in making everything. So it goes to say that that is the, the root point that I'm looking to reconnect. There could be levels higher than that, but as far as being in this creation goes, my beginning point to return to the root is Chochmah. Okay? Is Chochmah. So therefore, because of this, since knowledge is so important, that's the beginning point of everything, and my tshuva, retur repentance, returning dictates returning to my the source and my source in this case is chokhmah so if that's the case my tshuva has to be mostly associated with and affiliated with chokhmah so therefore he says Rav Nosen, therefore every person must guard his knowledge and his mind, his sechel, his brain, his mind, his intellect, from any foreign, unnecessary, damaging, bothering, distracting, disturbing wisdoms, intellects, hamechunim b'shem bat paro, which Rabbi Nachman calls in this letter, lesson, he calls all these type of categories of negative knowledges, pseudo-wisdoms, he calls them Bat Paro, the daughter of Paro. What's going on here? What's going on with Bat Paro? He's going to explain, in the lesson he explains, that King Solomon, he's the one who best relates to and is associated with Chokhmah. Because the Torah itself tells us in the Prophets that Vayichkam Shlomo, the king Solomon, 
became knowledgeable knowledgeable more than any other living being on the world. And that is meant to be understood that he's so connected to chokhmah, knowledge. And he's called Shlomo, which has two meanings, connotations. Sh shalom, peace, and also Shalem, complete. And that was really associated with the days of King Solomon, that in his days reigned such a high level of peace, and he would reach such a high level of knowledge, so complete. Even though afterwards he fell, and the downfall started, as the Torah explains to us, with his intermarrying Bat Paro, the daughter of Paro. He felt that he was strong enough to rectify and elevate any trace of holy sparks found within the daughter of Paro. And he's relied on his high level of intellect that he could successfully do so. Even though the Torah forbade him to marry a woman like Bat Paro, because he had already reached the maximum level of wives that a king is allowed to have, and he bypassed that, also marrying the daughter of Paro, by doing that, and he relied too much on his chokhmah, because that is the danger, that a person reaches such a high level of chokhmah, he has to remember that he has to also have emuna. He has to never, never, never budge from faith. And King Solomon, on relying on his sechel, his mind, his intellect, and by doing so, going against the warnings of the Torah, and saying, I won't fall into this, I won't fall into this, I won't, I won't, he actually did fall into this. And he did tshuva, obviously, he did wake up and repent and realizing his error. But it all began with Bat Paro. So now Rabbi Nachman explains what really does Bat Paro, the daughter of Paro, signify. Okay? So he says like this, Bat, a daughter, he remes lechokma she'ena chokma. The concept of a girl as opposed to a boy, please don't take this as a personal offense, but this is how the Torah is explaining ideas, the concepts. We, of course, have to work on ourselves, but this is how initially things are in life, in the world. And Bezit Hashem, when balanced, everything becomes beautiful. Everything works out nicely. But initially, a daughter, a bat, corresponds to a, a knowledge which is really not a knowledge. Like our rabbis teach. The Gemara there in Menachot explains a verse, I think, by the prophet Tzfanya, if I'm correct, that Tzfanya says, explaining a verse, bring my sons, bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the ends of the world. So the Gemara asks on this verse, <laughs> what's the difference here? The, the verse is saying, bring my sons from afar. Afar is far. And my daughters from the ends of the earth. That's also far. It's like a redundancy. You're saying the same thing twice, but once you say my sons, and the second time you say my daughters. So what's going on? So Gemara explains that it's referring to the Jewish people in two um, scenarios, in two segments of exiles, exiles in Jewish history. The sons who are being exiled, bring back my sons who were from far, exiled far, are referring to the Jews who were exiled to Babel, Babylonia. And the plus of being exiled to Babylonia is that because there was not so much taxation and decrees and pogroms against the Jews when under Babylonian dominion, so the learning of Torah was able to be continued with a type of clear-headedness because there weren't so much like uh, uh, judgments and difficulties for the Jews under the Babylonian exile. So Torah study was much more clear, clear-headed. And because of that, the, 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 the Babylonian exile is called a son because a son compared to a daughter, has more of a, a, a settled mind. Just to explain that in general, men are meant to, ideally a man, normally thinks with the mind, and a woman more generally thinks with the heart. In other words, the, there's what we said, there's what this faculty called Bina, which is understanding, 
which initially is located in the left side of the brain, but the refle- the expression of Bina, like the Zohar says, is in the heart. Bina liba uba halev mevim. Bina, understanding, is in the heart, even though it's rooted in the left part of the brain, of the mind, but it's in the heart, and in that, with Bina, understanding, the heart can understand. In other words, it's part of an intellect which is really connected to emotions. The side effect of that, the you want to say the disadvantage of that is that Bina, because it's connected to the heart, because wisdom that is expressed from the heart stays of a person much more deeper throughout their life. When you have a memory associated with an emotion, you'll see that those memories you seem you you seem to remember much much better because of the emotional aspect connected to them. However, because it's emotional, there's room for a misunderstanding and misinterpretation also, and it's associated with a non-settled clarity because it's thinking with the emotions of the heart. So, since a woman is more associated with understanding, yes, there's this amazing plus called understanding bina yatera extra understanding found in a woman, but there's also a chance of it being misinterpreted, which happens a lot, unfortunately, when not properly balanced, and that's more associated with a woman. Peace and shalom, completeness, is when there's interaction completely with Chochmah and Bina, that Chochmah is bent to share with Bina and receive from Bina, and Bina is bent to receive from Chochmah and to develop it. In that way, Bina is connected, coupled with Chochmah, and Chochmah is coupled with Bina. That's a joining of the masculine and feminine aspects together. But separate, it's pretty dangerous. Chochmah without Bina is like King Solomon's mistake. And Bina without Chochmah can be also very, very dangerous. Dangerous. It's considered unsettled. That was the idea of Bat Paro, a Bat, a daughter. It's unsettled. So when you're unsettled, there's lacking clarity. And the lack of clarity takes gives you the difficulty of much, much more time in life to connect to and achieve your goals that you've made. Because there's so much static <laughs> bothering you, you can't get to do what has to be done. It's just You're just mumbled and boggled down by so many things on the side. Your, your view is not clear of the matter because it's mumbled by so many things happening. So this Rabbi Nachman connotes to the idea of a bat, a daughter. So bat, he remembers the chokhmah she'en a like rabbis teach there in the Gemara and Masechet Menachot. Okay? So I didn't explain the rest of the Gemara. My apologies. So Banim are the Jews exiled under Babylonian exile where the Torah was settled. It was settled, mind settled Torah study and it was clear, clarity. Okay? And now Banot, the Marsha explains, is the Jews exiled and the other exiles. The Marsha explains there in the Gemara, specifically under Roman rule, Edom. Because the Romans, which is basically the European exiles of the Jews, because of the excess taxation and pogroms and difficulties in Jewish living, so the, the, the ability to have clarity in learning was very unsettled. I have to mention this point because it's something phenomenal that I heard recently from a, a Jewish historian, a Moroccan Jewish historian, who wrote an amazing book on the commentary of the Talmud called the Rif. The Rif, Rabbi Yitzhak Al-Fasi, is one of the main commentators of Gemara. He's one of the first, first codifiers of Torah law. He was from Fez in Morocco. That's why it's called El-Fasi, from Fez. And throughout Jewish history, there, there have been two camps of commentaries explaining the Rif. One by the Sephardic Jewry, and another one from Ashkenazic Jewry, that in explaining the Rif, there have been developed different perspectives on explaining how the Rif was the first one to codify the laws from the Talmud using the Talmud itself. Because if you look how the Talmud is set up, everything is mixed up. The Rif came along and just clarified clear, clear halacha based on the Gemara, but following the pattern of the Talmud. In other words, the, chap, the tractate brachot, the laws discussed, even if they're laws that are connected to another topic, not related to the laws of blessings, but are brought down in the Talmud in Brachot, the Rif followed the page numbering 
and the order in the format of the Talmud. And in that format, he brought down the finalized halachot. But again, you needed the Rambam afterwards, and then the official code of Jewish law by the Rav Yaakov, the son of Rabbeinu Asher, and then eventually Rav Yosef Karo, the Shulchan Aruch, who codified and separated clearly all the laws in each section. The laws of sleeping, the laws of saying Kriyat Shema, the laws of Kashrut, everyone in its proper section, fine. But now, the Reef, he had a certain way in explaining, and it was open to explanation. So they developed, like we said, two camps. So the author of this book, this, this Moroccan rabbi, explained something very interesting. He said that if you take a look in Jewish history, Islam had a major part in determining the quality and perspective of Torah study. He explains like this, that the, after the Talmud was sealed, began the era of the rabbis called the Geonim. The Geonim are after the time of the Talmud. The Talmud is what's called the time of the Amoraim. Before the Talmud was the time of the Mishnah, that's the, the Tanaim. So you have the Tanaim, who were living at the time of the destruction of the Second Temple. After the time of the, the at the end of the Second Temple, that's the beginning of the, or the time of the Mishnah era, the Tanaim. And after the destruction already was the time of the Talmud. That's why you have a Babylonian Talmud and a Yerushalmi Talmud. And then began the time of the Geonim. The Geonim were mostly centered in Babylonia, which as we said, the Jews in Babylon, they had more or less an easier time in Torah study because there was less decrees against the Jewish people there. Now, the Jews who lived in the North African countries, the Sephardic countries, they had continued access to the rabbis of the Geonim centered in Babylonia. Whereas, because of the rift that began between Islam and Christianity at that time period of the Geonim, so the connection with European Jewry to the Geonim in Babel was sealed off. So what happened was, this is something amazing because it fits in nicely to this idea. What happened was the Jewry throughout North Africa, even all the way up to Morocco and even possibly Spain, whenever they, whenever they had difficulties in learning the Torah and that questions that came up, they would simply send their question by horse, obviously, throughout, all the way from, North, like, even from Morocco, all the way to Babylonia, to Iraq, which is today Iraq, Iran, that area, and send their questions, even though it would take like a year or a year and a half to get back an answer, they knew to wait to get an answer, they would get an answer. Over 10,000 questions and answers, like in this format, were done. They discovered recently in a, what's called the Geniza, the, where, the place where they bury old, worn-out Torah information, Torah documents, in the Geniza of Cairo in Egypt, over 10,000 responsa were found by sages throughout North Africa sent to the rabbis of the Geonim in Babel. So you see that this was a common way of learning the Torah, that there was a difficulty, they would ask. Who do you ask? The rabbis who knew best. And they were the ones who were settled in Babel, Babylonia. Now, the Ashkenazi Jewry was sealed off with this contact to the rabbis in Bavel. So with that lack of contact with them, this forced Ashkenazi Jewry to develop their minds even more and delve into the learning and through learning with what they had available to reach their conclusions. And this is the possibility of explaining why there are different customs which stick out very much more than anyone else between Ashkenazi Jewry and Sephardi Jewry because of the approach and learning and accessibility. So if you want to say the Sephardic Jewry, they had more of a clear explanation of the Torah by having direct contact with the rabbis in Babylonia, whereas the Ashkenazi Jewry, they developed their minds more. But if anyone's familiar with a lot, and I'm not coming down, God forbid, to put down anybody, just different approaches in Torah study, but if anyone's familiar with the, what's called the Litvish world of Torah study, it involves a lot of digging and digging and digging and using the mind and using the brain. And it's a lot of what's called pilpulim, pilpulim. And not always do you come out of a clear answer. It's not clear. There's a lot of digging and digging, but clarity is still needed to get to the final result. As opposed to when you see the Sephardic jury, they have a lot. Okay, it's clear. Everything is pretty clear. We know what to do, everything. It's an amazing attitude in learning. Both are needed. Both are beautiful. Both are praiseworthy. 
But one is more associated with the Ben, which is Yishvadat. That was Bavel, if you can say. Another one is a Bat. And it's no one's fault here. It's simply being in exile that has caused these two attitudes. That there's a Bat attitude of a lack of clarity in Torah study because of so many distractions. You might think, though, that specifically when a person has challenges, when there's like obstacles causing a lack of clarity, that should be more precious, which is true. But still, at the end of the day, there's a lack of clarity due to the distractions. Whereas if now I have that clarity, I can learn much better, I have less distractions, I can have clearer learning. So in this sense, a ben is a clear-headed, minded learning, chokhmah, which is really a chokhmah, as opposed to a bat. This requires more development, but this basically is the idea. That's how a bat is compared to a ben. Now, that's, that's the Gemara Menachot. Now, what's Paro? How does Rabbi Nachman explain the daughter of Paro? What's Paro? Paro, Neshon Bitu, Paro comes to connote nullified, something which is not, which is nigh, N-I-G-H. Kmo Shekatu, like it says, Tafriu Ta'am. Paro, when Moses, Moshe, and Aaron requested from Paro, let the Jewish people free so they can sacrifice to God, let them go in the desert. So Paro was very upset. He said, you know, what are you now causing me problems? Now you got the Jews excited for nothing, and because they got excited, they're working less. He said, they're lama tafri ta'am. Why are you bothering the nation, the Jewish nation, from their work? By you getting them excited about a vacation, so already they're getting more lax and they're working. So, Vitigam Unculus, Unculus translates there on that verse that Paro said to Moshe and Aharon, why are you bothering the nation? Trigam Unculus, Unculus translates it as Tevatelun, Bitul, nullifying. Why are you nullifying the nation from their work? So that means, but Paro translates as a wisdom which is not really, a, sorry, a knowledge which is really not a knowledge, but, and Paro. And it's totally nullified. It's not even there. It's like a double, double negative. It's like there's nothing here. So he explains, Hainu, but Paro connotes Chochmot Betelot Shem Shar Chochmot. Nullified wisdoms. In other words, that they're not really a wisdom. You're, you're, you're getting absorbed into it, learning into it, going into it, but it's going to get you nowhere in life. It's not going to bring you to your Tachlit, to your true Tshuva, to re- return to the root of all creation, which is Chochmah. It's not going to help you get to that. Shehem what? And what are they? Shar chokhmot. Any wisdom other than what's called the wisdom of the Torah. Because he explains now. Ki ikar ha The essence of knowledge. Liknot shlemut. To earn completion. Which is the idea of chokhmat shlomo. The knowledge of King Solomon. Because he's called complete shalem shlomo. To acquire completion. Which type of knowledge is going to bring me to this completion? Einarak chokhmat elokut is only the knowledge of godliness. In other words, the knowledge of the Torah. Usha chokhmot and all other knowledge knowledge in the world available in this world, hemrak chokhmot betelot are only nullified, nothing, nothing type, nothing categorized knowledge. And they are not even considered as knowledge at all. And by entering this into your mind, it is a major blockage for you to connect to you to godliness. Now, does this mean, so I shouldn't learn a trade? If I have to work, I shouldn't learn a trade? Here it's different because this purpose why you're working and learning is for the sake of the Torah. But even then, you got to be very, very careful what you let in yourself, into yourself. For example, to become a doctor in medicine, many cases they make they make the student in university to learn philosophy, to learn Latin, to learn foreign wisdoms which aren't necessarily needed for the medicine itself, but they're required as prerequisites. Many times these prerequisites are very damaging to the person's the shama, person's soul, the person's amuna, and a person has to do a lot of davening in life what he learns, what he lets into himself, how he lets it into himself. It's a lot of prayer, but on a revealed level, level, a person knows that these type of wisdoms 
have a negative influence on me that I must cut, I must stop it. You have a person, for example, that he watches movies, he likes watching movies, he likes watching action movies and, and the science fiction movies, but he sees that when he's davening and learning, the, these thoughts of the movies keep on coming to bother him from his davening, bothering from his connecting to God. When he's trying to talk to Hashem, for example, all of a sudden thoughts from the movies come into him, and it could be a reminder that this wisdom, this knowledge, of these movies that you've allowed to enter your mind are distracting and are bothersome to your emunah. They're not real chokhmot and they must be cut out. Proof is, look how much they're distracting you from your devotions to God. For each person, it's totally different. The only way to come to clarification in this matter is a lot of david. We will stop at this point. And as usual, I say the homework is, please, if you can, take a look at Rav Nosson's beautiful prayer on this lesson. Prayer number 35, with the opening few paragraphs, two, three, four paragraphs of this prayer, focus on this point, on governing so much, please Hashem, protect my mind from allowing me to enter into it anything which is foreign, because the damaging effect will be too damaging. It's going to ruin me, it's going to ruin my spiritual growth. See there how Rav Nosen expresses this idea. If this is an item which really, really bothers you in life, you will become hopefully very, very moved from Rav Nosson's prayers, from this prayer, his words. You might even come to cry out of emotion because it's very, very serious. It's very, if you want to, the word in Hebrew is nogea. It really applies to many, many people today, what we're going through, because you have people of all types of maladies and sicknesses and crazy, crazy perspectives in the world right now. And it's all due to the education that people allow into themselves. If a person was on guard and he would protect what he allows into his head, he would be able to avoid many types of unnecessary sicknesses and problems and distractions and difficulties. May we merit through the merit of the tzaddikim to guard our minds, to protect them, to have a pure, pure head, a pure brain, a pure mind, and in doing so, that we can properly do tshuva. We see people, family members, who, uh, who do tshuva, become religious, and when they explain to other family members, to, like, I'm trying so much to get my parents to, to wake up to do tshuva, I'm trying so much to get my siblings or my cousins, and they just don't get it. They just don't see it. So from this you see that the main blockage of people to wake up is just a lack of knowledge. And the lack of knowledge is because of bat paro, because they let so much, if you want to call it garbage, so much bat paro, so much unnecessary foreign ideology and wisdom into their heads, knowledge into their heads, it doesn't let them see the clarity of the true chokhmah, of that there's a shem, there's a purpose in this world, there's a goal, this world is not a joke, this world is not hefker, this world, this world is not free for all, there's a purpose. There's a motive. People don't get it. You, you, you're shocked. I still, I try to explain to them and talk to them, etc., 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 right? People, they always say that. And yet, they don't get it. It's because the chokhmot chitzoniyot, the foreign ideas stuck in their head, don't let them appreciate and see and value the true chokhmah of God. So, all we can do really is work on ourselves and delve into Hashem for other people also, but especially for ourselves. And we have a big possibility that when our heads are clean and open up, that it can influence the minds of other people too. Okay, thank you for joining this class. We will continue, God willing, next week. And as usual, if you have any questions or comments, please email me at mayor E, M E I R E, at breastlove, B R E S L O V dot org. And here again, I'm posting it as usual. I spelled it wrong there, sorry, it's Mary. Okay, thank you, Miss Sandy. Thank you, Ribeiro. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for everybody who's joined this class and all those who will be listening to this class. Thank you, Miss Stoneman. Thank you, Isabella. All the best, everybody. Have a great new week full of energy, which is also connected to this lesson. We're going to go into it. There's the power called Chashmal. You can take a look coming up in this lesson. 
There's this concept called Chashmal, and it's connected to the month of Cheshvan. They both begin with the Chet Shin, Chashmal, Cheshvan, to be continued, God willing. Thank you. All the best. Have a great week.